Newport Beach was the perfect setting for an international film festival. Kate Beckinsale. Benedict Cumberbatch. I'm Milo Ventimiglia, and you're at the Newport Beach Film Festival. You don't have to twist my arm to get me to Newport Beach. It's beautiful. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Newport Beach Film Festival. I'm Variety Senior Editor Michael Schneider, and we are... First of all, still sad that we're not back at the resort at Pelican Hill, but we will. We will be getting back soon. The world is coming back, uh, but we still have this year's Lifetime Achievement honoree with us. He is Oscar winner, Golden Globe winner, SAG winner, BAFTA winner, and now, of course, he is the executive producer and star of Epic's Godfather of Harlem, the one and only Forrest Whitaker. Forrest. Hey, it's great to be here. Good to see you. So, Forrest, we're going to talk a little bit about your career, but why don't we kick things off by talking about Godfather of Harlem. It is such a tour de force for you as an actor and as an executive producer. Take me back to, give me a little bit of the origin story of how this project came together, how you got involved, and what enticed you to, to play Bumpy. Um, well, originally I was approached by uh, Mark Kwan, uh, Smith, and uh, James Atchison. They came to me with an idea about doing something about Bumpy Johnson. And um, we started to look at his life and, this, and we realized that there was a period, like in the 60s, that was really relevant. Um, his relationship with Malcolm X and his relationship uh, with Adam Clayton Powell. And so uh, we decided to develop out of there. And so we went to a writer, uh, that was with uh, Chris um, Brancato, and uh, decided to, uh, to embark on it. At first, I was just in it as a direct, as a producer. But uh, later, I decided uh, to be able to play the character and, and it was a great journey from there. You know, we, we all know Malcolm X, we all know Adam Clayton Powell, but you know, maybe Bumpy Johnson wasn't as well known in, in the public consciousness. So what did you sort of learn as you were doing your research and, and sort of got into preparing for this? Um, I didn't understand the complexity of the man. Originally, I knew that he was a, a mobster and a drug dealer. Um, I didn't realize his relationships with his family. Um, how he dealt with his children. I didn't understand. He was a master chess player. He was a poet that was published. He's uh, a strategist. He was one of the few people that was able to interface from Harlem into like the uh, Italian mafia and work with them to be able to move things forward. And so that was really interesting. But honestly, I think the thing that was most interesting was like going on a journey with him where you see this man who comes out of prison and uh, who's been kind of pushed upon by the world and like uh, violent in his own life. And he starts to come, become more conscious. I think what we watch and as the pro progression of the show goes is him slowly becoming more conscious. His relationship with Malcolm X influences his life and the way he thinks and sees the world. So at some point, he even starts to try to organize within the crime families uh, in a way that uh, was a proactive, very much towards the civil rights movement in the sense of, of um, uh, his relationship with Malcolm X and different things of that nature. So it was really interesting to get to play all those different things. I saw a recent interview where you mentioned that you, you were sort of starting to feel a little disillusioned with, with acting and that actually working on Jingle Jangle sort of brought you back, brought some, some sort of uh, uh, life and light back to, to acting. T -t Talk a little bit about that and, and sort of the journey for you in, in acting and coming to a point where maybe you were ready to sort of do something different. Yeah, I think I was hanging by a thread, but you know, it's a threat of being able to take care of my family and stuff too. So I had to figure out what I was going to do. Um, I think um, I was having a really hard time. I was finding no joy in, in, the, in the work. I wasn't progressing, not getting better. Um, wasn't looking forward to, to, uh, to doing the work. It became like a, like a true job, a chore that I had to do. And I had lost that sort of exploration because originally I was like, I'm, I'm diving into every character and I'm going to go to it and I'm going to find the link between each character I play and myself till so everything is one, so we're all the same. I lost that search, you know, I think I, I think I lost my purpose. My purpose was to just do that discovery. And um, so it took a long time. I was doing work and I, people were telling me it was okay. I was like, it's not so good, really. You know, I didn't have like a, a spark of, of like uh, imagination and exploration, you know. And um, yeah, I, I, I did a movie with, with David, David Talbert, 
you know, and he had such enthusiasm about things and life and what the project we were doing. And there was some magic that was happening. It felt like magic when I was working on it. Everybody was like uh, coming out of some Disney movie or something like they were so happy. You know, they'd be like, hi, hi, good morning, good morning. Everybody's working so hard on that little, little piece of the corner of the world when you when I was on that project that it really sparked something in me and uh, it started to come back alive a little bit. And um, then I think from afterwards, I was I was starting to do my work a little better. And, and then actually at the, towards the last end of Godfather, like maybe seven, eight, nine, ten, you know, whatever, I started... Uh, I started getting better. I made a decision to, to allow him to evolve so he could enjoy life in a different way, not be frozen. And that's what I was, frozen. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can see that that spark too in sort of your interactions with some of the other, great, your great co-stars on, on Godfather, like Vincent D'Onofrio and Giancarlo Esposito. Uh, you've really uh, championed a lot of great young new filmmakers. Yeah, Bobby. Boots Riley from Sorry to Bother You. Uh, yeah, Ryan Coogler, Fruitvale Station, Roxanne, Roxanne, Dope, Songs My Brothers Taught Me. Next up, you have Passing from Rebecca Hall. I mean, you've, you've managed to, re you have an eye for finding some really great talent and championing them early in their career. Talk a little bit about that and sort of, you know, your, your pride in, in sort of helping to elevate some of these young filmmakers. You have to give them a platform to be able to support their work because they, they have such so much to say and it's been, um, so I've been trying to, I've been working on that even before I had a, I had a company called Spirit Dance and we did about four or five films. It was mostly all uh, new filmmakers that were trying to speak and that I wanted to like help them be able to get their voice out to the world. And then um, now with Nina Yang, my partner, we've been able to, uh, I think, encourage like new filmmakers and, and, and hold them up as best we can to be able to do the work and be able to get their voices out there. Cause they're very, they're, they're artists on their own. We're, choose, we're just lucky that we were able to recognize what great depth they had as people and artists at, the, at an early stage, you know, I mean, when you could, I knew that Chloe Zhao was a, um, uh, an auteur, a great filmmaker, uh, just from my conversations with her and what she was doing, you know, and, and Ryan was passionate, I, I mean, it was like a meeting with him, you'd like to know that this person has a lot to say. Sometimes it's just to lend the playing ground for them to be able to express to be able to create. Speaking of films that are coming up, uh, tell me a little bit about Respect and, and uh, you know, working on that project, uh, uh, you know, with Jennifer Hudson. I mean, that's sort of a, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're looking forward to that. I know that film was sort of delayed by, by COVID. I think we're finally going to get to see it soon. Uh, but what was what was that experience like in, in working with Jennifer? I love working with Jennifer. Actually, this is the third time I've played her dad, you know. Uh, <laughs> that's... And, uh, we always really get along really well. She's like, she's she's really talented. We actually won the Academy Award on the same night together, so we were like, got to see each other. You know that. Yeah. So there's a bond already, you know, in so many different ways, you know. But she's um, beautiful. It's uh, Aretha. I mean, I, I play her father. I play, uh, you know, her dad, who's a um, uh, preacher. Mm -hmm. You know, this you know is very famous for this style of preaching called uh, hooping. And uh, who, who was also a civil rights activist, would work, you know, he did marches with, with Martin. They were very close friends and run with the King. And um, but we watched this Fingali like person, like trying to mold his daughter and force her to do things in the way he does. And a lot of it's uh, about her expressing her freedom uh, in her music and in her life. And so I, I think it's going to be an interesting film for people to see, you know, they don't know anything about Aretha. Is, uh, Jennifer plays a uh, woman that uh, shows some of the struggles that she had in her life. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, such a fascinating story, the, the whole story of Aretha Franklin. I love the fact that, that this is now a common thing. You're just going to continue to play her father, I hope, in you know, several more <laughs> films. Um, yeah. Um, uh, so, so speaking of, you mentioned the Oscars. We, we got to mention, uh, you know, that, that quite a career highlight. And uh, of course, all those accolades you got for, for Last King of, of Scotland. Uh, you still think about that moment? Do you still remember that, that moment on stage? Does that pop up as sort of a, you know, a, a seminal moment in your career? Or what, what do you remember about, uh, you know, winning that Oscar? I mean, you know, you're sitting there and then you, you, you hear your name and it's, it's like an electric shock going through you, you know, as you, you know, you get up. I think the thing I remembered most was like uh, probably that one of the things was that the other actors that were all up for the same role were all standing and 
giving me support and stuff. And that was uh, pretty impressive, you know. And I got a chance to try to speak to my community and stuff and tell them to believe, you know, to believe that they can, they can accomplish anything that they want, no matter what their circumstances may seem, you know. You know, that kind of a thing that's been the driver for me uh, to believe. And um, that's why when I lost that feeling, it was very detrimental to me as an artist. Yeah, well, I'm glad glad you got that feeling back. Uh, I'm curious, by the way, when when people because you have such a such a body of work now, what is it that people most ask you about these days? Which which project, or do they just have another burning question like, why do you keep playing Jennifer Hudson's dad, or <laughs> what, what's what's the sort of the burning <laughs> question people question have for you? <laughs> you know, it, 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 I've been really fortunate since I started my career. I I don't really play the same character too much. Um, and so the, the people that come to me are like, talk to me, they talk about different films. Like some people might talk about, you know, Black Panther, you know, maybe kids know that and maybe they know, um, you know, Jingle Jangle or, or, or maybe they know Star Wars. And yeah. then there's like an artistic group that maybe they know some obscure movies or maybe they know Ghost Dog or, you know, and it's got its own cult following or, or Last King because of the kind of intensity that was in, in that character. Um, so this, it's interesting, like it's people from all different walks and it's kind of kind of refreshing for me. Yeah, no, I imagine. And, and you're one of the, the few folks who both Star Wars and Marvel, you're 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 sort of you're part of both worlds. So um, yeah. I'm sure every once in a while, people who think they're clever and this is going to be include me bring up, uh, which is what do you remember about Fast Times at Ridgemont High? Oh, okay. And is that still crazy <laughs> to think that you were in that film? Uh, yeah, it was the start of a lot of our careers, you know, with Sean and uh, Phoebe and Nick Nick Cage, or you know. Um, yeah. I remember. I remember that we were all like young. And we were like working, and I was uh, in character and stuff. And I remember Sean and and David, a kid who was playing my brother, was like behind me, like discussing stealing my bag. You know, it was like we weren't working. We were just like walking around, living. You know, and I remember that conversation of them like in character, like trying to steal my bag, and and I guess. I guess it was it was kind of like a big start uh, kind of my start you know what i mean so yeah that was the kind of a leading moment for me you know um as an actor from there you you actually were speaking of being an iconic sort of franchises you're in two of the most iconic uh, movies about the vietnam war ever good morning vietnam and platoon um mm -hmm. uh, do you have any specific sort of memories of, of sort of that moment in time and, and sort of you know appearing in, in those films right around the same time I, mean, I think i remember auditioning over and over again for uh for platoon and then at one point oliver had me in the in the room and he would keep bringing in actors but i would still get to stay and read with him and stuff and i'm like do i have the part and, he, and i and he didn't tell me yet and i'd leave and yell out the window do better do better you know what i mean and, and uh i remember really well and i remember uh uh, you know, Platoon was unique because we all went and we kind of went through a method experience of, of, of the character. We were like given like a, a shovel, to, our clothes were taken, we were given new clothes, we had to dig a hole and they said, that's where you're going to sleep for the next two weeks, you know. And we would be out in the jungle learning about jungle warfare, we get attacked by the Marines, we get lost, not have any water or food, you know, before we started the film. So that was a unique experience. Uh, uh, for any kind of uh, uh, filmic experience that we all went through this experience. And then at the end, when we were going to start, we were, they took us out of a bus and they drove us to a river and they said, start crossing the river. And then they said, okay, start action. And they started shooting the film from the camp where we were in the jungle. I think um, the other one, like uh, Good Morning Vietnam, Robin Williams was um, just a unique person, you know, just a really special man. And uh, it's just mind-boggling, you know, like uh, the way he thinks, and and um, he was a special guy. So, two more films I want to get to because Bird was obviously your your first big starring role, and I think that was sort of, uh, you know, the, the 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 huge sort of propelled your career. That and The Crying Game, of course, two films that that really sort of brought you set front and center in in this world, and that's when things really took off for you. Um, what do you remember about that sort of moment in time, uh, you know, starting with Bird and, and sort of bringing you to the forefront? Bird was like an important film for me, you know, um, really one of the most important films for me. 
Well, first, because it's the first time I ever was trusted to play a leading role like that. I wasn't sure, you know, Clint was very sure. When I went in, I met with him. We didn't audition. Uh, he looked at a tape and, and I said, I, I think he gave me the part, you know, and um, I went and bought a sax that afternoon. And I just like find out later that the sax is broken and stuff. And I, I had been trying to make it sound good. When they gave me a real sax, uh, I realized how easy it was to make the sound after all the struggle I had had with it. You know, and then we went to Cannes with the movie. I was just a young kid, you know, I was, and I won the Palme d'Or and uh, I wasn't expecting that. I, I had no, no idea about that kind of thing. I had never even done hardly any press before in my career. You know, I was with like one of the biggest stars in the world and everybody's screaming his name, Clint, Clint. And when I like win this award as the best actor, I was like the youngest and the first black actor almost to, to win the award. And, and, um, and it, it, it it made the international world like look at my work in a different way. I think it made some people really recognize me as an artist and allowed me to make all these choices, uh, diverse choices like this doctor, this dictator, this whatever, you know, police officer, this federal guy, this drunk, you know, whatever it might be. It allowed people to see that I could maybe do that. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, and, and then look at this career. And I'm so glad that you've found that new spark and so much more to come with uh, uh, you know, Godfather of Harlem and uh, Respect and, and everything else that's coming up as well. Before we go, Forrest, we have a few messages from a few friends of yours who want to say a thing or two as you pick up this Lifetime Achievement Award. I'm so glad uh, to help celebrate Forrest's award at the Newport Beach Film Festival with Variety. Uh, you, your lifetime should be celebrated. Congratulations, Forrest Whitaker, on your Lifetime Achievement Award. It is so well deserved. I just wanted to reach out to you today to say congratulations on receiving the Newport Beach Film Festival Lifetime Achievement Award. Hey, Forrest, word on the street is that you are being given a Lifetime Achievement Award by the Newport Beach Film Festival. I've had the honor of knowing Forrest for many, many, many years, and I'm really, really astounded at how he is able to not only develop, act, direct, and produce projects that have integrity, moral value, and affect us all on a very deep and personal level. Most recently, I've been able to work with Forrest on Godfather of Harlem. Um, you are so amazing. I am such a fan and so honored to be able to work with you, not once, twice, three times as your daughter in respect and many other projects, even winning our Oscars together. You have provided a lifetime of great memories for the world throughout your career. And today, like all of the other accolades, this achievement is very much and well deserved. I'll never forget walking into my callback and not knowing you're gonna be there and being very nervous. But by the end of my scene, we both had tears in our eyes and I just remember being so comfortable and I remember thinking, what a remarkable performer and producer to be so present and so open. When I was driving him around, skidding around corners and doing all sorts of things, I happened to reveal to him that I've never driven before and that I don't even have a driver's license. And uh, he stays in character and gives his incredible Oscar winning performance. And as much as that's kind of funny, we did nearly die seconds later when uh, the crew failed to lock down the road and a pedestrian car just came by and nearly T-boned us and my bad driving uh, contributed to that. Nonetheless, he's so immersed, he's so committed, he's so incredible, he's such an example that he continued to give his Oscar winning performance. I think everybody here recognizes your great talent and your incredible and enviable body of work. Um, but for me, the work you do off camera makes you almost as deserving, um, if not more maybe, than the work you do on camera. And I'm so glad to see you be recognized for this award. Uh, Forrest, congratulations. It's an honor knowing you. I love and adore what you do, your commitment, courage, and your integrity and morality in every project that you touch really reaches down deep into all of our hearts and souls, allowing us to know that you are a visionary deserving of every honor and every compliment that you are receiving right now. I am so grateful that I've gotten to work with you and I look forward to everything that you and we get to do in the future. Congratulations. You are truly a man of the people for the people 
and I hope that you take this day to celebrate this achievement of yours the way you celebrate everybody else's. Mwah! Until next time, big, big love, enjoy your day, and congrats again. Peace. You're fabulous, I love you, congratulations. Congratulations, brother. Forrest Whitaker, it's all in the name. What else needs to be said? Congratulations, Forrest, on the Newport Beach Film Festival Lifetime Achievement Award. I can't think of anyone more deserving. You're an absolute legend, mate, and you are an example to us all. All the best, man. Have a great night. We celebrate you. I love you. Congratulations. Congratulations again. Thank you so much for joining us. The Newport Beach Film Festival Lifetime Achievement Award for this year. Forrest Whitaker, star and executive producer of Epix's Godfather of Harlem. Forrest, congratulations and thank you so much. Thank you. On behalf of the 13th District and the City of Los Angeles, congratulations on this well-deserved honor. I have followed your remarkable career since your first appearance on the silver screen as Charles Jefferson in Fast Times at Ridgemont High. This was followed by other memorable performances, from your portrayal of jazz legend Charlie Parker in Bird, to your Academy Award-winning performance in The Last King of Scotland in 2006. Each of these roles showcased your ability to transcend different genres, histories, characters, and stories. For this and so much more, we are thankful and honor you with this award.